Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Yosha Diabe. I'm an operating advisor of USGI. My job is to introduce what USGI does, and then the real session will start for well-known gentlemen. Okay, what we are is like this. In April 2010, we established uh, NPO in Washington, D.C. in order to increase the volume of uh, universities research results from Japanese universities and from by jointly with the net universities. And somehow we have been doing that. And one of this, these sessions are organized every year twice, once in spring and April. Uh, spring and in the fall. And this session is one of those sessions organized in the fall. And um, USJI's principal members are eight universities in Japan, four national universities and four private universities. National universities are Tokyo, Kyoto, Kyushu, and uh, Private universities are like uh, Itsumeika and Doshisha from west, and go up to north, um, uh, Keio and Yasu. And I used to be an undergraduate at Keio, but professor at Waseda University. So I'm connected to <laughs> Anyway, um, I have to get the permission from you that we are recording it will be uploaded for uh, public uh, consumption. And that's all I have to say. Jim, it's all yours. Introduction. Let me begin uh, this afternoon's session uh, in the following order Professor Sato, Professor Oda, commentary by Jim Shaw, and I might have a thing or two to say myself when they're done. So let me turn it over now. So. Asia Pacific University, and uh, I have a, a 
great uh, fortune to be invited through uh, my friend and colleague from Kyushu University, uh, Professor Oda. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about the utility of the US Japan Alliance for Security in Northeast Asia. So this is outline of my talk. I'll talk first about the post Cold War transformation of the Alliance itself and then talk about the implications of regional security issues and also the expectation of Japan's neighbors on the US-Japan alliance. One of the most important uh, feature of the post-Cold War transformation of the US-Japan alliance is that the self-defense force has become more active abroad and this this symbolizes uh, Japan's departure from uh, most strictly interpreted defensive defense posture, and Japan is doing more to contribute to uh, international peace outside of Japan. And the second important uh, feature of this change is that the alliance between the U.S. and Japan has become more mutual. So it's not that Japan only depends on the United States for protection, but uh, uh, Japan contributes to the United States security to a greater extent. The third feature, I think, is that uh, the scope of cooperation between the United States and Japan has broadened, and now they cooperate not only on narrow uh, military defense, but they cooperate on various aspects of uh, non-traditional security, namely uh, piracy or uh, terrorism and other stuff. And I think the disaster relief, again, is uh, also an important feature of this bilateral cooperation. And fourthly, I think that uh, the new security partnership uh, emerging between Japan and America's other allies, such as Australia and Korea, and some other uh, non-treaty partners, uh, in, mostly in Southeast Asia, and also uh, uh, the concurrent development of relationship between Japan and India on one hand, and US and India on the other, and some limited but growing uh, trilateralization of that relationship is also an important feature. Okay. Uh, let me talk about implications on some regional security issues. First, obviously, as Jane pointed out, North Korea continues to be a uh, very important issue in the region. And the trilateral coordination among US, Japan, and Korea has been revived despite the ongoing diplomatic issue between Japan and South Korea. I think compared to the time when uh, Christopher Hills was in charge of the Korean Peninsula Madras, the trilateralization has revived itself. And, and second, I think uh, US-Japan relations and especially this uh, trilateral uh, cooperation among Japan, US, and South Korea has put pressure on China, and it is more difficult now for China to protect North Korea at all costs. And this has made China an uh, important player uh, and a stakeholder on this issue, but it doesn't mean that China has completely given up on North Korea, so the situation is still not very easy, but the trilateral relations of Japan, Korea, and the uh, United States is putting pressure on China. And thirdly, I think that the integrated missile defense capability is important especially given North Korea's uh, growing range of uh, ballistic missiles. 
and the contingency planning on the peninsula continues to be important, if not more, because of uh, uncertainty about the current uh, leadership of young uh, Kim Jong-un. The Taiwan Strait, for now, has been quite quiet, but uh, I think there is an expectation that the uh, upcoming presidential election will bring up uh, some of the old issues about Taiwan again. And the Taiwan has been pretty quiet about its expectation of the U.S.-Japan alliance, and, and U.S. and Japan also remain, deliberately remain quiet about the alliance role in the possible Taiwan Strait contingency. I'm not going to go into details of that, but maybe we can discuss later in Q&A if you have some questions. Um, but nonetheless, the possibilities of including Taiwan in the missile defense corporations have been floated uh, from time to time. And also, it is quite implicit that the Japan's regional contingency law has a contingency in the Taiwan Straits in mind, although the officials can never admit that. And when they do, they lose their job. And, but scholars are free to talk about it. Uh, Senkaku Island, the East, East China Sea, I don't have to repeat a lot of the things the media have already reported, but I think uh, the reaffirming the treaty's applicability has been very important for Japan, and so far I think Japan has done a quite good job at that, at forcing the words out of American officials' mouth. And also they have uh, demonstrated the joint defense capabilities through various uh, exercises, and the joint opposition to China's declaration of the air defense identification zone uh, since last November have also uh, put a strong deterrence against uh, some aggressive Chinese behaviors in the region. And humanitarian relief and uh, disaster relief and humanitarian assistance uh, really symbolizes the broader security cooperation involving both military and civilians in both countries. And the Operation Tomodachi after the uh, great uh, Eastern Japan earthquake disaster and the Fukushima nuclear disaster, uh, very much uh, uh, symbolic of that cooperation. But uh, also in the Philippines, uh, the, after Typhoon Hainan, uh, US Japan cooperation played a very important role in uh, helping the Philippines uh, victims. Quickly go through uh, expectations of the regional countries. Uh, China has shifted from accept accepting the coke in the bottle uh, analogy of the US Japan uh, alliance. Now they see the alliance as an attempt to jointly uh, contain China. And in response, they are uh, quickly modernizing the naval capability and clearly uh, showing the signs of challenging the US Japan dominance in the Western Pacific region. South Korea is somewhat ambivalent. On one hand, there is a growing uh, uh, effort to trilateralize the relationship with Japan and States. But at the same time, the military thinking does not necessarily agree with the political leadership's thinking, especially about the, uh, their skepticism about cooperating with Japan. So that keeps uh, South Korean attitude somewhat uh, ambivalent about uh, uh, closer relations with U.S. And also, I will not with you, sorry, close communication with uh, Japan. North Korea, of 
proposes the joint uh, missile defense capability and the effort to uh, uh, prevent the proliferation of the weapons of mass destruction by Japan and the US and also Korea. And, but at the same time, North Korea is seeking a dialogue opportunity uh, with the United States and especially they want to do so without making any concessions on the nuclear weapons issues. And for that, North Korea sees Japan as a possible bridge to reach the United States. And so the ongoing uh, abduction talk is viewed with uh, some skepticism in the United States. Russia is seeking a multipolar regional balance of power. So for that, Russia wants Japan to act more independently of the United States. And for economic uh, diversification, Japan is a prime uh, candidate for a strong partnership. And Russia is very much looking at Japan in uh, that kind of expectations. But at the same time, Russia doesn't have a strong material to drive a wedge in the U.S.-Japan alliance. Therefore, their wish remains to be a wish. And, you know, that it's easy to point out signs that uh, Japan is trying to be modest in terms of uh, in imposing sanctions on Russia for the issues in uh, Ukraine and uh, other European uh, uh, issues. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that Japan is diverging from the United States to a great extent. Okay. Uh, Taiwan's post ma leadership is uncertain. And also, uh, to some extent, Taiwan's approach to Japan is more about symbolism rather than about tangible cooperation. And plus, Taiwan itself is having a territorial issue over the center group, uh, the Aoyu Island issues. So uh, that poses a dilemma to Taiwan. Mongolia, I don't know if Mendy is here, my friend Mendy. Uh, I saw his name, but uh, maybe he's not here. So maybe I have to talk about Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia's third neighbor policy become, makes uh, both the United States and Japan, the prime, prime, prime third neighbors. So uh, in that sense, Mongolia very much welcomes uh, close uh, US-Japan uh, cooperation and its possible role uh, to diversify Mongolia's uh, security partnerships. So I should stop here and uh, pass it to Olga Sanka. Asia Pacific and expanded East Asia. Um, 
Well, firstly, the East Asian digital is includes the ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, and ASEAN free trade area and East Asian free trade area. The characteristics is that only East Asian countries can become members. And second, the Asia Pacific region is includes APEC, TPP, EFTA, the FTA in Asia Pacific. They're not only East Asian countries, but also the non-East Asian countries can do it. And thirdly, the expanded East Asian regionalism. Um, this is a regionalism based on the ASEAN, but other non-East Asian countries can join it. The, in this sense, the East Asia or Asia Pacific is not geographic concept, but political notions uh, whether a particular region includes the United States or not. I mean, in the East Asian region, the United States cannot join it, but in expanded East Asian region, such as East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum, the United States can join it. Then, the region in East Asia is much more, uh, yeah, much more complicated and the different types of regions has been overlapped each other. Yeah, like right this. Now, uh, also there are some tensions between global norms and principles and the regional stability and regional community buildings. For example, the principle, principles of Asia Pacific regions is uh, including open regions, democracy, and free trade. And traditionally, the there are strong dichotomies uh, against the Asian bodies and the Asian ways for no international principles. Also, the after making of ASEAN Charter of 2007, civil society movements have become so active in Southeast Asia. So traditional Asian ways have been challenged, and there has been the two different understandings of the ASEAN. Uh, it's a, It's people-centered ASEAN and people-oriented ASEAN. The people-oriented ASEAN, um, uh, people-oriented ASEAN is emphasized by the ASEAN or government side. The decision making is based on the ASEAN. The policy should be coordinated for interest of the people. On the other hand, the people-centered ASEAN is advocated by civil society. Um, it means the people and the civil society should much more participate in the decision-making process uh, of the ASEAN. Then, um, there have been intense confrontation between people-oriented ASEAN and people-centered ASEAN. And as I mentioned, also, uh, there's another tension between Asian ways and Asian bodies uh, and the open data. Then, uh, I moved to US-Japan relations. Then, one of the key questions for Japanese foreign policy is how it is compatible between the US-Japan relations and East Asian regions. The history of Japanese foreign policy since the 1990s is a history of rights and the decline of East Asian regions. The basic approach of Japan is a balance of the US and East Asia. And therefore, the open regionalism and Asia-Pacific regionalism uh, has long been the key policy for Japan from the late 1960s to the epoch on the 1990s. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, after the, financial, after the Asian financial crisis of 1997, ASEAN Plus 3 is organized, and Japan shortly shifted to East Asian regionalism, advocating the East Asian community based on ASEAN Plus 3. However, uh, in the East Asia, East Asia Summit of 2005, Japan argued to include the non-East Asian members, Australia, India, and New Zealand. So, Japan later shifted to Asia Pacific regionalism, um, advocating East Asian community based on US-Japan alliance. Then, um, in the late 1990s, the Japan-US Security Alliance has been redefined and reconstructed. On the other hand, uh, in the economic field, Japan gradually shifted to East Asian regionalism, uh, such as ASEAN Plus 3 in the late 1990s. Well, uh, in the 2000s, uh, Japan-US Security Alliance uh, has been much more strenuous 
on in the 2000s. It designed from bilateral security relations to regional security community building. On the other hand, the East Asia Summit is organized in 2005. Well, um, Japan shifted from East Asian community based on ASEAN plus three, but uh, that on the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. Also, as a U.S.-Japan relations, Japan has continuously emphasized on the universal values of freedom, democracy, and free markets. Then, um, I move to Japan ASEAN relations. The Japan ASEAN relation is developed in the late 1970s. In the Fukuda Doctrine of 1977, uh, Japan stressed on the equal partnership and friendly relationship to the ASEAN. And in 2002, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi also articulated community that acts together and advance together. And the Tokyo Declaration of 2003, advocating deep, uh, deep deep in East Asian cooperation for um, East Asian communities. However, um, by declaration 2011, uh, Japan is back to Asia Pacific region and just mentioned the ASEAN plus three EAS and ARF are the important process to promote cooperation of ASEAN communities. Then, uh, I quickly move to US ASEAN relations. The U.S. ASEAN relations began in 1977, but uh, basically on the political and security issues at this time. The relation is expanded on economy and development during the 1990s. And most notably, uh, Barack Obama, the much more focused on Southeast Asia, and he's called the first Pacific president and advocating league balancing to the Asia Pacific. And then, the United States joined the TAC, uh, TAC, uh, is a mutual respect for sovereignty and non interference principles. And, and the numerous leaders meeting and the summit branches between the United States and ASEAN. However, uh, there are numbers of fields of tensions between the United States and ASEAN. The first issue is the politics. Uh, the first issue is the politics. There is a potential conflict between liberal democracy and Asian values. After establishing ASEAN Charter, there has been another tension between people-oriented ASEAN and people-centered ASEAN. In other words, um, it is a dichotomy between democracy, human rights, and social economic development. And on the security issues, there, there are a number of maritime border issues between ASEAN countries and China, especially in South China Sea. Um, economic issue economic issue is a much more complicated. The ASEAN China free trade area and also regional comprehensive economic partnership. And TPP is a different framework to combine Southeast Asia and the United States. And likewise, uh, there is a confrontation of regional framework between East Asian regionalism and Asia Pacific regionalism or expanded our uh, East Asian regionalism. Now, to be summarized, yeah, uh, in U.S.-Japan relations, the Japan is emphasizing on Asia Pacific regionalism, and U.S.-Japan alliance and universal values on democracy and human rights. The Japanese foreign policy is a shifted from East Asian regionalism and Asia Pacific regionalism, and this is what I call the Americanization of the Japanese foreign policy. And the, likewise, uh, also, uh, and there is an East Asian region and ASEAN plus three between ASEAN and Japan. Um, also in the, uh, also in the United States and ASEAN, uh, expanded East Asian regionalism and TAC, TPP, uh, that enhance the uh, U.S.-Japan connections. That there is a tension between people-oriented and people-centered ASEAN uh, within the ASEAN charter. And they, uh, I mean, United States, Japan, and ASEAN, uh, they share the economic and security threats from China. 
But um, comparatively, the, it is somewhat the uh, generalization of US foreign policy. The ASEAN expands the, the partnership of the regions. And also, the ASEAN centered regionalism to Japan and uh, and ASEAN Center region is, is expanded to Japan and the United States. Um, Japan, US, ASEAN, and China are differently connected and confronted in the different fields. So, US Japan relation is a key to understand expanding the regionalism in this region. The sometimes, East Asian regionalism is confronted with the US Japan relations. On the other hand, US Japan relations also sustain and stabilize Asia Pacific region. So the question is the not East Asia or Asia Pacific, rather how the US Japan relations stabilize and complemented complemented the different kind of regionalism in the region. Well yes, the thank you for listening and, and uh, thank you for your cooperation. Please join me thank you. Before turning it over to Jim Shaw. Jim, you want me to pass this down? Uh, will it stretch? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I, before I begin, I, I want to add my thanks to USJI uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel. I, I think USJI has done a tremendous job here in Washington, really expanding Washington's exposure to a wide variety of scholarship from Japan, so uh, that's been a great addition to, to this town, and my thanks to my colleagues here today as well to, to be a part of this discussion. Um, I'm going to pick up on a, a couple of points that, that have been raised in Sato-sensei's and, and Oga-sensei's presentations, and I may step back a, a, a bit um, at, at the very beginning to think about why, why might we want this? Uh, as, as a part of, of, of the alliance or as, as a feature, because this is not something that has always been a relationship. It began primarily as a, a, a way of providing security for Japan, and in exchange, uh, U.S. Uh, received access to, uh, uh, to bases to help uh, support a, a stable uh, regional security uh, picture. And as time went on and the relationship matured, the, the roles that each within the alliance that, that we began to play together slowly began to expand. Notably in 1978 when we first uh, redid the defense, uh, created the defense guidelines, the, uh, the guidelines for defense cooperation at that time, uh, later on uh, uh, through the 80s as well with a very heavy security focus, and then as the Cold War ended, we began to expand beyond just security and look at a, at a broader range of, of cooperation as Japan's economy and, and, and diplomatic profile uh, grew, grew a lot stronger. So then you had the global partnership in 1989, 1990 or so, and then the common agenda in the 1990s as a way to try to address uh, common interests, common strategic interests, and leveraging the talents and the, the, the resources and the, the connections that, that each of us had. Uh, but that was all taking place in the context of pretty intense trade-related tension and competition. And so now we have a very different situation, I think, where not only do our interests align uh, quite dramatically in a lot of different places in the world, uh, particularly in East Asia, but that sense of competition has uh, become much smaller. And so there's, I think, a truer partnership or a truer potential for partnership, uh, and not just in the security sphere, uh, than, than, than we've, we've ever had uh, before. What we're ultimately trying to accomplish is to support stability in the region and openness in the region and access and I would define access as being the ability to help preserve the first two and there is a bit of a competition in this regard with China I think China wants stability in the region 
it wants openness to a certain degree, but not necessarily the same definition of openness that, that, that we would have. Uh, and they certainly don't agree with the access component of, of that, or at least they want some uh, element of access or, or ability to deny that access in, in certain situations. Uh, so that shapes a little bit of our overall objective. As we think about the two different regions, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, I think it's also important to point out how different they are in some ways uh, in the context of how the alliance interacts with them. In Northeast Asia, uh, there's a relatively severe threat environment from North Korea, which is a very strong mobilizing factor for, for the US-Japan alliance in that context. And also incredibly intense, deep trade relations amongst the three big economic powers in Northeast Asia, China, South Korea, and, and Japan. Uh, so you have both of these things sitting side by side, uh, which is a very different situation than down in Southeast Asia, where the focus of the alliance tends to be, again, on stability, but also uh, directly connected to the development of regional architecture, regional governance, uh, a, a more open and dynamic uh, set of trade relationships and economic relationships. And, and we're still in the very formative years, or early years, I think, of, of Southeast Asia's development. Uh, so what role the alliance can play and how we interact, I think, is, is, is a little bit different in, in each uh, region. We have the question of, um, uh, should the alliance interact or engage in these regions as an alliance, together, joined at the hip? Or is it something more independent and, and coordinated, where each of them are uh, uh, interacting on their own, in their own way, but in a way that, that is, 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 is coordinated, communicated? Um, and and Oga-sensei's uh, point talked a little bit about this uh, in the context of the Asianization of US foreign policy or the Americanization of Japanese foreign policy, because our when you get down to more specific interests, we do not uh, necessarily share the same uh, objectives or priorities in, in, in these different regions. And the policy environments in each of our countries is also very different. And I'll, I'll use um, uh, uh, one, one key um, uh, example of that in just a minute. But I, I do agree with Sato Sensei and his discussion about China has kind of changed from its previous acceptance of the cork in the bottle theory and now sees uh, uh, US-Japan collaboration or, or tightening of, of cooperation in, in a more threatening or containing containment uh, type of view. And that, that gets a little bit to this dynamic between Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia because the common element in both of those regions, despite their differences, is China. Uh, so it's hard to separate somehow, sometimes, what we do in Northeast Asia versus what we do uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And so we need to think about that as well. Um, Professor Olga shows this overlapping um, of strategic interests, I think, quite, quite well. And also the evolution of, of our policy approach in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, which has had uh, been overshadowed to some extent by this very strong alliance focus, and then at times this more regional uh, regionalism focus in, in Japan's foreign policy uh, in, in particular. To some extent, they're actually beginning to come together uh, now. And, and I would agree with the way you've, you've described that. Uh, we have focused the alliance management infrastructure is heavily focused on security issues. We use the two plus two, or the the, uh, the, the, the top level meeting between foreign minister, defense minister, secretary of state, secretary of defense, as the, the, the organizing uh, mechanism, leadership mechanism for our alliance. It was designed primarily originally just to manage the treaty uh, and the, the issues related to bases and other things that would pop up uh, related to treaty management. It was never designed to deal with a wider range of broader regional foreign policy issues or uh, coordinating uh, overseas aid programs or uh, dealing with uh, pandemic flu issues and 
uh, as um, Santos Sensei talked about, our cooperation is expanding uh, in, in a whole bunch of different areas. So our Health and Human Services Department is working with the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare on different initiatives and programs. And we have uh, uh, industrial cooperation and, and, and te technology cooperation in space and in cyber issues, which get into commercial issues, which are also have security aspects. And so we see a much more multi-layered, inter-agency, uh, multidisciplinary uh, type of cooperation that is becoming much more difficult to manage. Um, the, the, the one example I wanted to, uh, well, before I get to that, so right now we're in the midst of, of reviewing our current defense guidelines and, and how we're going to, to manage this uh, uh, relationship, again, primarily looking at it from a security point of view. Uh, but I think as we've seen the, the changes going on in, in Japan, the cabinet decision to allow some element of collective self-defense, uh, the Alliance is clearly doing more than it ever did before, and it needs a different type of uh, coordinating mechanism to deal with that. So I expect you will see, out of these defense guideline discussions going on right now, the creation of a new kind of standing coordination body uh, that won't be very large, but will be there to help link both the operational uh, requirements and accountability that comes with working more closely together and the political accountability that comes with working uh, in terms of strategic messaging and making sure we're, we're well coordinated and we learned a lot in the 311 cooperation experience about how challenging such a big uh, uh, undertaking can be we did pretty well but but we're going to use that experience to, to to go forward I think so my last example I, I wanted to raise is is the example of Myanmar or Burma as, as, a, as an interesting foreign policy uh, challenge to both the United States and Japan that is, has direct strategic relevance to both of our countries. Uh, it fits within this context of where we want to see uh, Southeast Asia and ASEAN go towards greater democratic governance, toward greater uh, economic openness and, and integration. And, and we want to help them succeed. We, in a sense, we both want the same thing. But the policy environment in Washington vis-a-vis -vis Burma, because we don't call it Myanmar, because we don't recognize the legitimacy of, of, of that uh, uh, decision to change the name of the government that made that decision, very heavily focused on human rights, democracy first as, a, as a, kind of an organizing principle. And there's a lot of complaints now on Capitol Hill. We're, we're we're giving in too quickly, we're, 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 we're loosening uh, sanctions, etc., too quickly. Whereas on the Japan side of the equation, you see a much different approach. They want the same things, they have programs for governance, good governance, etc., but they're looking more to trade first agenda. We want to develop stronger relationships, build, take a long time horizon for measuring progress in Myanmar. And so this is an interesting challenge, I think, in the future of the alliance for how we manage important foreign policy issues that are important to both countries, uh, that we maybe have slightly different priorities and different environments to deal with, but nonetheless, I think these are the, the challenges of the future, uh, even more so than some of the hard security issues, is, is how do we deal more, more comprehensively with, with these types of challenges in the region. So I, I just wanted to add that as, as one example. Thank you very much. Sensei's papers, as well as Jim's comments, represent two really comprehensive presentations with respect to the alliance relations with Japan and Southeast Asia. I only had a few comments and basically try to tie them together. Now, it should not be understood that my, my comments are a pay-on to the Abe government because I think elements of today's evolving security policy and strategy really represent continuity with the previous NOTA government, in particular the concept of joint dynamic defense.
defense, which was previously under the NOTA government, was dynamic defense. So I, I, there's, there's a continuity here. But I do have to say that I was impressed with the st strategic vision that marked the first two months of the Abe government and was later reflected in the national security strategy. In particular, the first two months of the government, of the new government, in January and February of uh, 2013, when I watched the prime ministers and, and foreign ministers' travels uh, across the region, uh, Philippines, Australia, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc., I had the feeling that I was watching a game of gold when you see the stones being placed on in the corners of the board and you saw the evolution of a strategy, um, which I thought was really fascinating to watch and it aimed at enhancing Japan's uh, relations with the key countries of the region and at the same time moderating Chinese, growing Chinese influence as well. And then coming to the United States in February, a visit aimed at strengthening the alliance in its deterrence posture at a time when the U.S. is facing real budget constraints in its defense budget, a clear recognition that Japan has to do more and is going to do more. And I think it's a clear recognition as well that Japan is going to, is and will play a larger role with respect to regional stability and security. Uh, and it's reflected again in, I think, the, ex the decision with regard to the exercise of collective self-defense. I think this is all very positive uh, with respect to the challenge that we are facing right now. Pointed out North Korea, that's not going away in any time in the near future, and its nuclear missile development programs are only accelerating. And with China, I think the key point that Santo Sensei made was the issue of access. And going back to the start of U.S. engagement with Asia, Access has been at the core of the U.S. strategy towards Asia. It was access that was behind the opening to Japan. It was access that was behind the open door on China. And it's been access that has guided our policy uh, in the, in the post-war era. Remember, we opposed Prime Minister Mahathir's East Asian caucus because it was excluding the United States. We are very much focused on being played into the region being seen as part of the region. And so when the Chinese attempt to restrict access, they're really posing a fundamental strategic challenge to U.S. national interests. And in terms of the U.S.-Japan relation, access is absolutely critical in terms of our credibility to extend deterrence. If we cannot access Japan, the credibility of extended deterrence will be called into question. So this is a very important matter. And I think these issues are going to be reflected in the, in the uh, review of the defense guidelines that are now scheduled to be completed by the end of the year. But I also think that watching uh, Japan during this period of time, uh, I think Japan, it, it's clear that Japan has moved to re revise the three principles on arms export. It's guidelines to allow uh, construction of dual-use facilities in ways that enhance national resilience across Southeast Asia. And uh, I was recently in, uh, in Singapore and uh, Vietnam and, and, uh, and Australia, and to a man, uh, everyone was highly laudatory of the Japanese efforts in terms of capacity building in, in, in Southeast Asia. People see this as a real contribution that Japan can make that will enhance regional stability and security. Um, but I, I think also to be welcomed, to my mind, was, was Prime Minister Abe's emphasis on international rules and norms, and the way that he has, I think, effectively internationalized the issue. I was really struck earlier this year in a two plus two statement that was issued at the conclusion of the of France Japan 2 plus 2 meeting. And the statement, uh, to my mind, the, the emphasis was on international law, norms and rules, peaceful resolution of disputes in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, uh, opposition to force or coercion in the resolution of disputes, 
And when I looked, read the statement, even in my grad school French, I said, wow, this, this was like it was written in the Guyman Show. And it had a very I think, direct application to the challenges that we are both facing in the region. And, I, and again, just watching the evolution of Japan's policies towards Southeast Asia, as Oga Sensei has pointed out, the support for multilateral institutions, building the concepts of building an Asian community, uh, these are all very positive contributions that Japan is making. Uh, and ultimately, I don't see really a, a real conflict in terms of regionalism or the alliance. I see these things as mutually reinforcing in ways that support regional stability and security across the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, multilateralism in Southeast Asia, absent the U.S.-Japan alliance, would have very little meaning. And the U.S.-Japan alliance, I think, is very important in terms of reinforcing the growth of ASEAN and strengthening its, the related institutions. So, um, to conclude, I, I guess I don't want this to be a tribute to the Abe government, for there still is a lot of work to be done, in particular with respect to the ROK relationship uh, and respect to with respect to China in moving, working back toward the concept of a mutually beneficial relationship based on common strategic interests. So there's a lot of work ahead, but I think looking back over the first year plus uh, of the Abe government, I think a tremendous amount has been accomplished. I think mean, Japan has moved very positively to assume a larger role in terms of the alliance and in terms of support for regional and global uh, stability and security. So let me end here and turn it over to you for questions. Yes, ma'am. I didn't talk much about the economy, but I think uh, the TPP represents what all of a sudden termed as uh, Asia-Pacific regionalism, as opposed to the East Asian regionalism. And uh, for that, I think the Japan's joining the TPP has really uh, uh, symbolic of Japan taking a clear side between those two. And the military basing, I think, uh, you know, I have some friends in Okinawa and who are very opposed to the like, US basing there, and I hear a lot about their arguments. But fundamentally, I think that uh, some degree of US basing in Japan is absolutely necessary for the alliance maintenance. To what degree? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not the uh, you know the tactical experts. So you know, should Osprey be in Okinawa or somewhere else? You know, a lot of tactical details are involved in that kind of questions, and uh, I'm not going to go into that much detail. But a degree of U.S. military presence is uh, assurance that the alliance commitment by the United States will be uh, uh, guaranteed. So without basing, you know, Prime Minister Hatoyama talked about the alliance without American basis. I think that's not going to happen. Um, the brief my answer is yes, the, it means the uh, Japan, has, Japan has 
has to join the ATPK and Japan has to maintain the US-Japan alliance. But um, my yeah, uh, my brief picture is that the Japan favors the United States, and the United States favors ASEAN, and ASEAN favors Japan or East Asian based regions. But the uh, problem is that the as Jim Shop um, explains, the way United States or Japan approaching to the ASEAN, the problem is the democracy and human rights. Um, in yeah, um, as my ex um, as my presentation explains, the, there is a dichotomy between people-oriented ASEAN and people-centered ASEAN. Then, um, as a Professor Kristat also points out, the Japan emphasizing on the, the international issues. The, it means the Japan take a cooperative approach uh, with the United States to the ASEAN, and it stores the democracy and human rights approach. But um, I think it perhaps the becomes an area of conflict between US-Japan alliance, the ASEAN, uh, I mean, the democracy and human rights uh, will be the area of conflict uh, between US-Japan alliance and the ASEAN or East Asia East Palestine. Jim, can I just quickly, okay. um, thank you. Uh, when you asked your question, it reminded me of something I wanted to mention before, which is Sometimes when we're in the process of, of in, an, in the alliance, thinking about how to coordinate or cooperate in, in different regions, uh, often we, we tend to think that we're doing this for the other partner. You know, uh, well, we're doing this and this is helping provide security for Japan. Or Japan might think, well, we're doing this, but we're doing it to help the United States uh, maintain stability and, and, uh, and, and deal the region. And I think it's important for the leadership in both countries to keep bringing it back home in terms of why is this good for us? Uh, so in the, in the collective self-defense debate, etc., uh, that was always something, I, I thought it was always better when the government talked in the context of, of how this benefits Japan's security and why this is important to Japan, not just why this is helpful to keep the alliance strong. The alliance is not an end in and of itself. It is a, a very valuable relationship that has mutual benefits, I think, we have to keep focusing on. Just one. Yeah, just with respect to uh, your question regarding TPP, having to join TPP. Um, again, just the point that Jim was making, I think this is really in Japan's interest, that this is critical to effecting a structural reform that can really truly revitalize the Japanese economy. It's in Japan's interest to join TPP. I think that, that's the starting point the way I look at it. Um, is it, um, you know, the concern is expressed about the ROK also extend to China. But I think even in China today, economists, uh, I was in China in July that I spoke to, have come to see TPP as affecting structural reform in China very much along the way that the Chinese leadership viewed WTO entry. It was an external force driving internal change. And I think at least at the economic level, there are any number of economists in China today who see joining TPP as in China's interest. So I, I think it's important that you think about the alliance, you think about TPP, you think about this relationship, to my mind, it's important to define it from the respective countries' interests. And in my case, I think there's a mutuality of interests that have supported this relationship over the years. And looking ahead, uh, you know, I think it's very important that we think about what kind of order we want to live in in terms of the Asia Pacific region. Do we want to see an order where the Chinese send boats in, deploy oil rigs? And continue to operate on that on that on that line of approach, or do we really want to see a normative rules-based order? And I think both the United States and Japan share a mutual interest in maintaining and supporting the continuation of that order. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation and comments. Based on the past question, I'd like to ask two points. Probably here is a uh, fundamental. But part one 
is that uh, it is not, how can you say, it's not important to exclude China from US, Japan, ASEAN region or is not, in, not possible to categorize China as a common enemy or rival from these three countries and regions. So how to include China to the US, Japan, ASEAN regionalism? This is my first question. And of course, as Mr. Shok mentioned, uh, we have different uh, priority or object objective to China. So how to manage that point that kind of difference? The second question is that uh, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, there is not um, how can I say it? it is not always possible to categorize ASEAN as a unified actor or one actor because as I mentioned um, each country has different priorities or objectives to the, the ASEAN or to the relationship between China or Japan and the US. So, if so, how we can categorize the members of countries in, inside of ASEAN from our it means Japan or US perspective? relationship between the Japan, US, China, and ASEAN. So, uh, for example, in the East Asian regionalism, or even expanded East Asian regionalism, they also is include China. So, uh, I don't mean to exclude China in the East Asian regionalism. And on the second question, the, actually, uh, I'm not sure sure to understand the locations. The ASEAN is not unified actors and of course we can yeah. uh, see mm. ASEAN as a unified yeah. actors, but not always. So it's a uh, yeah, there is a different perspective within ASEAN and how we manage mm. that policy. So we can specify How we can categorize each country's motivation for the priority or priority for us. Uh, actually, I'm not sure at this point. The, yeah, I I just explained or uh, the my research focus on the ASEAN as a unified actors and. The, as, a, as a unified actors, the how ASEAN cooperate Japan or the United States. The, of course, the individual countries has an uh, individual interest, but uh, my research doesn't focus on this one. Let me throw my two cents in there. Uh, nobody is explicitly talking about excluding China from anything. But I think Japan and the United States have clearly sent a message to China that their inclusion in the regional economic and possibly security cooperation comes with conditions. And conditions that they have to, that China has to abide by the existing rules and norms. And Japan and the United States have a very close understanding about what the rules are, what the norms are, whereas China doesn't seem to be very happy about the existing rules and norms, and there are signs that China is trying to change them. And if 
China continues to behave in such a way, I think exclusion is a possibility. And it has to remain a possibility in order for us to discipline China into a better behavior. And uh, about ASEAN, I think that uh, it's true ASEAN's interests are diverse between the member nations, but if they cannot overcome some of their own differences, ASEAN as an institution will stop functioning. And all of the ASEAN member countries, they talk about you know not making us choose between China and the United States. And, and the United States pays uh, great attention to this ASEAN's needs to kind of uh, stay in balance between them. But uh, if China succeeded to divide and conquer individual ASEAN nations, then you know ASEAN becomes meaningless uh, organization of uh, you know annual diplomatic karaoke sessions and nothing more. Now, I, uh, my other two cents, okay, on this one with respect to China, the issue of inclusion or exclusion. You know, I think if you go back to the time that Dung opened to the market, the last 30 years, U.S., Japanese, European strategies have been, all been remarkably similar. They have been to engage China to move it toward what Bob Zilla defined as the responsible stakeholder position. And that overwhelmingly, 95% of our strategy has been aimed at that main avenue. I think the other 5% is how do we manage the risk that it doesn't work the way we want. And so when I think about the alliance structure in Asia, I think about it as a risk management tool. How do you manage risk? It's very much like uh, an insurance policy. You know, um, I'm betting that I'm going to be here 99% tomorrow. That's my bet. But I've got to figure out what happens if I'm walking across the street, bam, and you hit by a car, that 1% is gone. How do I manage that risk? Well, that's an insurance policy. You manage risk through an insurance policy. And so conceptually, when I think about what's going on in Asia, is that we are trying to move China towards this rules-based order to include China as a, in terms of supporting international norms and rules, and the peaceful resolution of disputes, et cetera. That's our fundamental objective. But we're also engaged in thinking about, OK, if this, this doesn't work, how do we protect our interests? And I think over time, the alliance structure has been that insurance policy. That's the way I think about it. In terms of ASEAN, yeah, I think there's, there's clearly internal tensions. I think it was revealed in 2012, uh, the failure of the Cambodian and Afghan summit to issue a joint statement down very hard on the Cambodians and Laotians, and I finished that off. And it was only through the very hard work of the Indonesian foreign minister that the pieces were hard to getting to be put back together again. During this recent trip, when I was in Australia, someone made the point, you know, why waste your, trying, why waste your time trying to build ASEAN as an effective institution? He said, if you want to make and if you want to make ASEAN an effective institution, what you need first to do is to strengthen the individual states of ASEAN. If you have stronger membership, stronger state membership, you will have a stronger institution. So that's another way of thinking about it. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think that's why it's so important when we think about the Abe governments, and as well as the United States, focus on capacity building in Southeast Asia. We are trying to build the national resilience, the national strength of key partners and allies, the Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam. These, this should be the focus of what we're about. If these countries are stronger, ASEAN will ultimately be stronger.
with the domestic uh, conservative, uh, with the agricultural. So do you think that we can overcome the domestic uh, problems from both countries so that the TPP can conclude successfully? To that point, what would you suggest Japan have to do and what would the U.S. have to do? And also, um, if the system has said that the accessibility is important, so would you discuss the situation, the, the relationship between U.S., Japan, and Vietnam, and also U.S., Japan, and South Korea? Because both Vietnam and uh, South Korea are the peninsula. Uh, it has connected land border with China. And both have half. North Korea is communist country, and Vietnam right now is a communist country. So geopolitically, they connected uh, in a different way with China comparing to other countries in the region. So how do you specifically see the vision, the vision of Japan in relationship with South Korea and in relationship with Vietnam for that geopolitical uh, vision? And also to another point, India for the Indo-Pacific Ocean. But when you see India in the pictures with Japan, US, and India, a relationship because of the connection with Pakistan and the missile and the potential problems with the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay, who wants to start with that? Something to say? Jim? Not good questions. Uh, yep. Let me skip the uh, TPP question. I think uh, all of us can answer that. Uh, let me talk first about US, Japan, and India uh, question. I think there's a growing prospect of closer cooperation among the three countries, and, and possibly with the addition of Australia, there's going to be uh, four countries, and uh, Japanese prime ministers uh, in the past uh, are they, uh, also, they have both. Uh, refer to that kind of uh, possibilities. Indian Prime Minister recently visited Japan and uh, they did discuss uh, uh, security cooperation and you know, some first arms uh, sales from Japan to India took place and, and so float, uh, what is it called, floating plane? Yeah. And the craft that's in Sydney. So, uh, so I think it's a growing area, but uh, I can also point to limitations, however, and, and that has a lot to do with uh, India's uh, kind of history of uh, non-aligned diplomacy, and that will pose limit to both uh, U.S.-India cooperation as well as uh, Japan-India cooperation. But nonetheless, within that limitation, I think this trilateral cooperation will grow in the coming years. And the second uh, question about the uh, uh, comparison between US, Japan, Vietnam, Triangular relation in Japan, US, uh, South Korea, Triangular cooperation. I think both countries, Vietnam and South Korea, share uh, common uh, geographical feature, geopolitical feature, and, and that is they are not the archipelago on the edge of the continent. So, so in that sense, I think Japan and Philippines are similar in a geopolitical sense, more similar. And uh, I think Koreans are uh, always concerned that the U.S. need alliance with Japan, but maybe not the alliance with Korea. <laughs> and depending on how Korea behaves, U.S. might somebody uh, someday you know, give up on South Korea. Um, and I think that comes from their geopolitical uh, situation of this uh, kind of amphibious character as a peninsula nation. And Vietnam shares some of that in my view. Uh, I think I should answer the TPP things. Uh, yeah, also, I thought the, it's a very different to overcome the domestic conflict or domestic factors. But um, not only TPP, but also the other issues. Yeah, for example, if United States and Japan are approaching to the same, the domestic, um, domestic factors uh, also has a problem. But um, also, there are some domestic problems. Um, 
In the thinking of the foreign policies, the Japan's better way of doing uh, is to balance the United States and the ASEAN. This is what I want to say. Um, I just back to the previous questions, the exclude or include, excluding or including China. Um, yeah, uh, in my sense, the, this is not a question to ex exclude or include, but I think it's a question of liberty. For example, if Japan has a conflict confronted with China, um, then um, Japan should rebalance to the U.S. or ASEAN. Um, as you said, the Japan, India, ASEAN relation. Yeah, I think the India is a one um, one of the factors uh, to rebalance the relationship between Japan, China, ASEAN, and the United States. Yeah. Thank you. I I want to address that issue of challenges, domestic challenges, it's a good question. Uh, you mentioned it in the context of TPP. Um, it shows up quite clearly in, in, in the Congress or in our legislatures and in public opinion as how do you deal with that, how do you overcome that. I, I do think there is an argument to be made, uh, which has to be made by the leadership in each country uh, about the benefits of that cooperation TPP in particular. Uh, we have not, our leadership has not tried to make that argument yet. Uh, they have decided right now is not the right time to do that. Uh, there is a coalition of in the private sector and in, in geographically around the country that you can you can mobilize that, but it's a, it's a lot of effort and it's politically costly, uh, but I think it can be done. Um, and I think the, the same thing can happen in some of the other areas. So human rights, democracy, some of these challenges, again, where Congress plays a very key part. Um, I think the argument to be made there from an American point of view is to think of leverage in a different way. We think of leverage in very short term, in a very short term context and primarily in the context of, of uh, some kind of sanction or withholding something. And we see it in the context of Thailand now, we're kind of legally restricted to do certain things the, uh, after, after the coup d'etat. Um, and in Myanmar, it's more a case of, of um, holding back until they demonstrate progress, near-term progress on constitutional revision or, or uh, other kinds of reforms. I would like to see someone make the argument of leverage being uh, shaped differently by partnering more closely with Japan, for example. Japan has extensive relationships with the Myanmar government. The U.S. has strong relationships with civil society in, in, in Burma. Um, Japan has far stronger uh, aid, economic, private investment relationships. So I'm not suggesting a good cop, bad cop kind of uh, thing where you know, U.S. tries to punish and Japan you know, offers the carrots in a coordinated fashion. But if you can convince key senators and, and congressmen that a closer partnership with Japan gives you more leverage over the long term in terms of how do you enable the change you want to see in Myanmar, you may have to readjust your timeline for how quickly things happen. You can't just go to Japan and say, you need to sign on to our timeline or our agenda for, for Myanmar. There's going to have to be compromise there. But I think the compromise is worth it in the longer term in terms of how leverage then gets expanded if we adopt, uh, you know, and this gets to uh, Oka Sensei's point about Japanization of, uh, uh, of, of U.S. Myanmar policy, uh, you know, and, and there's a little quid pro quo, but that's a real challenge for our alliance. We haven't tended to do things in that way uh, yet, but I, I think there's an opportunity. Let me just throw my pennies worth in on this one. Um, holding back. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling back, that's right. With regard to um, Vietnam and South Korea, when I was in Vietnam two weeks ago, it really struck me that both Korea, South Korea, and, and, and Vietnam are really prisoners of geography. They're stuck, and so fundamentally, at, at a strategic level, what they're looking to do is to find balance. How do you balance relationships with China? It's not going away in the United States. How far can they trust the U.S., et 
etc. So these are these are fundamental strategic questions. Uh, I think I, it, it, it takes me back a long time now, and it's the Council of Foreign Relations, and um, we went to Korea, and we had a lunch with Kim Dae Jung uh, when he was president. This was shortly after the, uh, the summit in Pyongyang, and of course the press was uh, just rampant with talked about peace declarations, peace treaties, end of the war, the alliance was ending, and all the rest of that. And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, looking at the press, I said, you know, is, is there a future for the alliance here? And he said, well, let me explain it to you this way. He said, there's, you sounded just like Hans Morgenthau. He said, there's great big land power to our north. It's not going away. And we've got this great maritime power to our east, and it's not going so we are small, we are here, but you guys, the U.S., are big and strong, and you are far away, and that's why we like you, and, he said, and that's why the alliance is going to continue. And for a progressive politician, he had a very real politic understanding of Korea's position and why the alliance is so important. And again, these are both countries trapped by geography and trying to find a way that they can balance these critical relationships. Yes, sir, there's a question back. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have a big voice. Okay. My name is Kikuchi, and I'm with Washington Research and Analysis. And uh, of course, uh, no one likes a big surprise. I just wanted to remind everybody after all these seminars on how great Abe-san is uh, from the U.S. perspective that. Uh, and while LDP is important, uh, there is a strong majority of Japanese population that do not necessarily agree with Mr. Abe, especially as regards to watering down of the Constitution, the peace Constitution, or the interpretation thereof. One of the major uh, issues, I might just keep it short question-wise, uh, uh, to, Ms. Uh, to Professor Sato, uh, you mentioned that Russia is lacking material to convince Japan. I think furthest from uh, truth, uh, Russia is the country closest to Japan geographically. You can see Russia uh, from parts of Hokkaido, uh, especially of some of the Kabumai Islands that they keep. And, if, and Mr. Putin, when he's coming, if he would even so much as say, look, we're going to return to Japan, Habomai or Kunashir, uh, everybody in Japan would say, hooray, you know, what do you want us to do for you kind of situation. Instead, uh, the United States is trying to draw Japan into a conflict that Japan has nothing to do with, namely the situation in uh, Ukraine. Uh, already Japan is going to put its air travel as at risk by joining the sanctions uh, of what essentially is a European internal conflict. One might think of Afghanistan, there was some uh, reason for Japan to be involved, but there is no reason for Japan to be involved, collective or whatever uh, thing as. Uh, to, to, to join in uh, Ukrainian conflict uh, in support of U.S. and European sanctions. So, uh, in a way, uh, I, I'm wondering what, whether Japan isn't giving up on a major card for a long-term 60, 70 years of uh, hope to get part of the Northern Territory back and the peace treaty with uh, Russia. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, I must uh, have to disagree. I don't think Russia has offered anything so far. And there has never been very explicit commitment from Russia to more sincerely negotiate the Northern Ireland issues. And without any such message, why should Japan give in on other issues? Uh, and still, you know, Japan has 
kind of moderated, you know, its response to uh, the Ukraine crisis. Uh, I mean, Japan's joining sanction is minimal uh, at this moment, and uh, the more symbolic than tangible. So, so in that sense, uh, Japan is already paying uh, diplomatic consideration to Russia, but Russia is not responding in kind so far. So I don't think this issue will move any further. <laughs> question here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, sure. Yeah. I think the constitution before uh, can also be explained by the balance. I mean, the, if uh, our cabinet takes a nationalistic approach against China, and then uh, Japan has to Japan has to be debalanced by the United States, or uh, has to be debalanced to the regional security community. If so, the constitutional reform is a kind of answer to be found. Sir. We, we are, let me just say, we are getting close to Nishikori time, so. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Further questions? We'll try and get a couple, then we'll move on. Okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. I'll say thank you very much for your good re uh, presentation. Uh, so, I learned a lot, and uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I have a question about uh, foreign policy of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, as you know, on July, uh, he changed the uh, uh, interpretation of uh, the Article Number no. 9 of Japanese Constitution. Uh, as a result, we now could have the right of collective security defense. Uh, this is absolutely uh, perhaps good for the United States because the United States is now uh, decreasing your uh, military expense. And uh, I think the collective security defense uh, is uh, almost like a uh, burden sharing uh, for the United States. And uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, foreign policy of uh, other administration uh, towards uh, especially China uh, and Korea is quite uh, aggressive. So. Uh, if the conflict uh, between Japan and uh, China uh, will uh, change into like a real world, so uh, the United States uh, cannot avoid uh, being involved uh, in the war. So, uh, so this is a very serious uh, problem uh, for Japan and also as well as uh, the United States. So, uh, what do you think about the uh, foreign policy of uh, Prime Minister Abe in terms of a uh, good relationship between Japan and the United States. So I'd like to ask uh, all of you. Do you have your hand? Thank you. Uh, so you have a question, is the security context? Or? Uh, yes. Uh, security context. Yes. Want to start down there? Finish up here? <coughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll just add a quick impression. Um, I think a decent amount of the blame for poor Japan-China relations in particular uh, lies with China right now, um, the, uh, both in terms of its reaction uh, around the Senkaku Islands and, and other aspects of its foreign policy. And, and it's, it's, it's trying to use, I think, some of its foreign policy problem as leverage to get a concession vis-a-vis -vis the Senkakus and, and uh, to, to, in exchange for uh, a summit between uh, Xi Jinping and, and Prime Minister Abe. Uh, the, the one exception is, is uh, Abe's uh, visit to Yasukuni or, 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 or the, the, the recurring theme of, of this history debate for kind of continuing to call into question certain aspects of issues that have been settled. Um, so that's that's challenging from Washington's perspective. We would like to see, you know, let's take politics out of history. Let's uh, let's let's let the academics talk about it and, uh, and 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 not mix the two. And then we can isolate the the, the challenge or the problem in, in Beijing. So the foreign policy overall, I think Washington really understands. It's faced with a nuclear North Korea. 
improving its capabilities and, and with China growing quite, quite strongly. And, and Japan is not increasing significantly its military spending. It is not significantly changing its interpretation. Uh, uh, I think the compromise with Komeito on, on the cabinet decision was quite appropriate and, and is still within the spirit of, of, of Article 9. Uh, so I think that's relatively modest. It's, it's this, this history issue that keeps making it uh, more challenging, but, but overall I, I think the foreign policy approach is, uh, is reasonable from, from Washington. Uh, it is similar to previous, but uh, the reinterpretation of the Constitution to collective security is one of the answer to the balance of policy to the United States the, against China. But um, I don't think it is uh, good for the United States. I mean, uh, I think the best situation for the United States is the stability in the East Asia, I mean, the stable relationship among Japan, China, and Korea. So if um, there is a conflict among the three countries. Uh, it is not good for the United States. Well, I think uh, the United States uh, policy, if you read the uh, you know, rebalance to Asia in its entirety, you know, China is not the enemy there. You know, China is to be engaged with the opportunity for you know economic interactions and even possibly security cooperation. And you know this year China was invited to bring back naval exercise for the first time. US wants to engage China. And US Japan conflict and you know, not the US Japan, sorry, China Japan and the ongoing uh, disputes over the Senkaku Islands and diplomatic uh, 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 conflicts is making it difficult, but at the same time, the U.S. is not telling Japan to, you know, to be nice. The U.S. is telling China to be nice. And U.S. understands that the Japan's responses to China's provocations have been very well under control, very cautious and reasonable. I mean, China is really provoking Japan so that Japan would pull the first trigger. You can see that by you know the China flying civilian aircraft over Senkaku. I mean, Japan responded with F-15. What if Japan shoot it down? The world opinion will blame Japan. Uh, China knows that, and you know, China talks about flying uh, unmanned, uh, the, you know, reconnaissance plane over the East China Sea, and you know, Japan said if it violates the territorial airspace, Japan might shoot it down. You know, when Prime Minister Abe said that, then China said, "Well, China will consider that as an act of war." Well, has Japan shoot it down? No. And, so, you know, Japan's behaving very cautiously, but accident might happen if China keeps provoking like this. And uh, I think that's the danger that the U.S. will have to respond to. Very quickly, uh, my last half cents word here. Um, you asked, is the issue of collective self-defense the decision with regard to, is that good for the U.S.? I would say two things. It's good for the U.S and it's good for Japan. Go back to the first Yanai Commission, the committee report, and it talked about four situations. One of them involved an attack on a U.S. ship where a Japanese ship was close by. Another it, uh, focused on a missile launch uh, from somewhere toward the United States that Japan could have the opportunity to shoot down. Under the existing interpretation, Japan could do neither. Were that to happen, uh, the alliance would be under severe strain. The alliance could take a significant hit, and in terms of the U.S. public opinion, um, and the end of an, the end of the alliance is not something that's in Japan's interest. So that's the way I would look at that. And re issues related to history, you know. What's interesting to me is the Chinese definition of history ends in 1945. <laughs> uh, and 
when they had the joint history study, I remember Kitoka Sensei said, that's the last time we're going to do that. Because what the Chinese did was they walled off the Great Leap Forward, they walled off the Cultural Revolution, and they walled off Tiananmen. So 60 years of history disappeared. And they're talking, you know, and, and the issue of Japan is more than 60 years old. So I, I, I think it has to be have some perspective when you think about history in the context of the Japan-China relationship. I'll never forget, my good friend, Frank Fukuyama and I were both on the policy planning staff of the State Department. At the time, he wrote The End of History. I told him, Frank, you're absolutely wrong. It's never going to end in, in Asia. So, <laughs> let me close with that. Abe Sensei. We're, we're getting close to uh, opening, so thank you very much. <laughs>